Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Our topic for tonight is preventing athletic injuries with head athletic trainer of the LA Clippers, Jason Powell. Jason, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very excited about this interview. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for having me. Finally. So, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up becoming the head trainer for the LA Clippers. And, and my understanding is you've been a trainer for like 25 years. Yeah, I just finished my 25th season here with the LA Clippers. Uh, my first season was 1999, ironically, the first year that the franchise moved into Staples, which is now crypto. Uh, I actually started off as an intern with the L.A. Clippers. And uh, then when I left the, as an intern, I went into a full time position with the San Francisco 49ers, uh, left that football experience and then came back in 99 as a head athletic trainer. And I've been here um, ever since and enjoyed it. Uh, the franchise has been good to me. I think I've um, done a, a job that they've been, you know, happy with and moving forward, you know, as we continue to grow in the profession and as an organization, you know, it's always forward thinking um, with the franchise and with our profession. That's great. Yeah. So um, I also understand that you were a college basketball player. Do you feel that that helps you in your work as the Clippers trainer? Yeah. And it's, um, you know, it kind of came full circle. You know, I got into sports medicine and athletic training not to work in basketball. I got into it just for the love of uh, sports medicine and just health care alone. Um, it just so happened that I did play college basketball and I'm back into working with, you know, basketball athletes, you know, having worked football, worked numerous sports while I was in college doing my under, understudy. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I tell people it beats working, you know, working the sport <laughs> that you play and that you that you enjoy working with and just helping athletes. That's just I think that's the nature of what I'm doing and what I enjoy to do. How, how different is it working with basketball players versus, say, football players? Um. Big difference, uh, football, which I call a collision sport, okay. is different than basketball, which is a contact sport. And you know, you you football is more of a triage. You're trying to get guys back on the um, back on the field readily right away. You know, now it's a 17 game season, so it's still a lot of games, but you're trying to get them ready. You know, by the week. You know, in basketball, you may have four games a week, so it's kind of more like chess with basketball more like checkers with football uh so uh, just the mentality of the player is a, a little bit different um how you communicate and what you put together as far as a format um, and strategy of players for their return to play as as well as for a game prep is a little bit different but i think football really really prepares you for any sport that you work i think the type of injuries and the kind of things that you see in football over a span of one week you may not see for almost the entire season in basketball. You get right. more um, chronicity type things in basketball. Um, in football, you, like I say, you see more traumatized kind of things, more acute type injuries. So um, it's a big difference, but it's all encompassed of at the end of the day, the common denominator is uh, helping athletes, no matter their football or basketball. Right. So let's talk about um, a, a big part of your job, right, is how to prevent and manage these injuries. So how do you assess athletes to screen for the risk of injuries and what factors do you see as the most significant? Um, it's pretty comprehensive and every organization is different. You know, we'll put a player through a, a movement analysis uh, screen process. Uh, we see how they move in all, all different planes of movement, you know, the sagittal frontal transverse plane of movements. Um, you look at how they jump, you take, you know, force plate measurements, force plate is a, is a testing tool that you can test for symmetry, um, or asymmetry in, right. in, a, in a person's uh, limb, uh, output. Uh, so this yeah. is something when you jump on it, it detects how much pressure and how much pressure, how much load you right. have on one limb comparable to the other. Right. And if there's a difference between the two and how much, 
load you have and force that you're generating through your actual, you know, output. So, right. so you know, we, we and that's part of our sports science department. Uh, they do a really good job, you know, putting that kind of thing together. You know, we have we do growing tests, uh, growing tests, growing strength tests, uh, calf strength, you know, growing bar, um, um, calf um, strength bar. So we we put um leg extension bar for for quad strength. So we we put a lot of different testing measurements together that can kind of comprehensively be able to tell us what we need to do or what we need to get better at from a from a performance standpoint. Um, we actually we'll do table measurements for um, goniometric measurements for hip range of motion, ankle range of motion, shoulder range, um, ankle ankle range of motion, which is big, uh, big toe range of motion. So. I like I love it because you get to see you can kind of peel back the banana from where a player may be to where you want them to go and what maybe has made them to be successful for where they are now, right? So uh, you kind of put these um, these metrics together and kind of figure out a a, a plan, a workout plan, uh, a manual therapy plan for restrict you know, things they may have restrictive um, with their hips or or their ankles. And we have pretty much a, a routine and and flow where they'll go and do table work, then they'll go and do some active range of motion movement stretching, um, then they'll go and do a lifting based on what the assessment shows, which incorporates some corrective exercises. Uh, and then they go into more performance based um, strength exercises. So everyone has their own plan, um, their own customized program based off their evaluation and their assessment. And then that's how we kind of put our our day to day, our week to week plans for the players, and it it it's modified throughout the course of the season and how we do things in the beginning of the season. So there there's an off season evaluation assessment that we put them through in season, and then of course a new off season based off what uh, limitations they had or injuries they may have had during the season. So it's pretty comprehensive. It's real good. It's just, it's the bulk and um, meat and potatoes, as I should say, of our of our assessment plan for right. what I call injury risk management rather than yes. injury prevention, because there's risk of injury, but we want to try to manage you from those type of risks that you can receive. And I never get caught up in the term of injury prevention, right? You know, you can't right. prevent injury. Right. Um, there's so many force, force factors that come into no matter how hard you train, um, you have forces that come against you. So you just try to manage the risk of injury that you can probably endure. So of the various factors, what are some of the most important ones? Mm -hmm. You know, we have mechanics, we have range of motion, you mentioned, we have balance strength, uh, stability. Uh, what are some of the most important ones? Give us some examples of some things that you see um, that are liable to, you know, create uh, increased risk of injury. And what can you do to correct those? I'm not I'm I'm not I'm not married to or biased to any one being more important than the other. I, I think right. they all I think they all synchronize hand in hand, believe it or not. Um however, if I had to choose what we like to or what I like to look at the most is your movement pattern, right? Um how you how you're lunging into a movement, how you're squatting into a movement, how you can functionally bend down, how you can functionally reach um in different planes of movement. Um, is it the hip that's limiting you? Is it your foot ankle that's limiting you? Is it you can't push off your big toe? And what is that reason? Right. Why? Why aren't you able to do that? Is it previous history? Did you have, you know, uh, plantar fasciitis? You have, a, you know, tight arch. Did you have uh, ACL? Did you have some lumbar pain before? Um, did you have some surgical intervention that re that remodeling created some restriction or some restrictive movement patterns? Um, and, you know, do you just have a congenital um, hereditary type of uh, lack of um, opportunity to move at the hip? Do you have cam deformity? Do you do you have some labral issues in your hips? Do you, where, where's the restriction coming from and why are we having that? So I think movement analysis um, is, is a big part of it. Uh, to me, uh, we can break down all the parameters. I mean, we go as in depth as far as nutrition. Um, what's uh, hydration? Uh, those are two other factors that are big into how you perform and what can create or limit the risk of injury that you can have and all these components. And when we talk about nutrition, I think that's a huge part of it. I think nutrition is another um, what I call um, 
plan B of of, of injury um, management um, with movement. Um, I mean, I, I can go in depth, but this is a whole nother um, podcast is uh, the mental health, the mental health component of it. Um, how your brain functions you know, with sleep and how you recover um, in terms of you being able to move the right way, uh, the energy output that you have, which is under nutrition, sleep, rest, recovery. So there's so many components, but uh, how you move is is real important. Yeah, why don't, why don't we do talk move? about that for a little bit? I was watching um, another podcast episode with some biomechanical guy, and he was explaining how there's a tendency for if athletes, when they're running or uh, lunging or cutting, if their knee goes in a little bit, in other words, if it adducts and and they're also in flexion, that that's a common issue that's more likely to lead to an ACL thing. So getting athletes to make sure that their knees are tracking properly is is. is Give us an example okay. of a few types of things that you see, so, so like, you know, simple, uh, s- a simple movement pattern. You look at a, at an athlete who just say go into a lunge position into the sagittal plane, right? right. Guy lunges forward and you look at, okay, first, how is he, how is he foot striking with the left foot lunging forward? Right. So right. how, how far can he lunge? Um, how, what's his limitations? What about that? If he's lunging forward with his left why isn't he lunging as far or as m- with much control? Is it because does he have restriction in his right hip to not be able to lunge forward um, enough in, with his with his left uh, foot strike with his ground reaction force? So now with his right leg in the in the in, in the back stance phase, does he not have enough push off with his big toe? Right? Can he not push off his big toe? On his right, on his right foot, to in order to have a a, a good forward lunge with his left with his left leg, right. is it a restriction in the toe foot, or is it a restriction in the ankle? Is it a restriction in the right hip that is creating that lunge pattern on the left side to be restricted, and not just restricted with the range, but restricted with the control? Right, with what's the controllability do you have in the right. hip? Right now, if you lunge forward with your left and have a valgus stress at the knee, now you're looking at, okay, is that because he has a restriction in his left ankle? Does he have a restriction and weakness in his left in his in his left hip? And is it coming from his right side, a lack of control, because he doesn't have control? So those are the tricky things that you look at. You slow down the movement patterns, you know, and kind of um peel back and see what it really is. Is it coming from the actual um forward left leg lunge? Uh, movement or is it coming from the opposite limb um, hip hip extension restriction or toe extension or is it actually just weakness in just hip control is the lumbar pelvic hip stability um, weak and now he doesn't have control in his movement pattern or is it or is it just a restriction in range of motion or is it restriction in strength right? right now you go into the frontal plane and now you may have a different restriction and you may move better in the in the frontal plane now what muscle groups are you recruiting allowing you to move better in that plane of motion contrary to how you're moving in the sagittal now you get into a more you know um idealistic movement pattern of the transverse plane and where you have a movement but you know some some players can move better transversely because they they're big compensators right we all know that and we talk about that too the the compensation component of athletes who are, are really good at moving in the pattern least resisted right so you know it's really tricky how you look at movement what you're really looking for and how you study that and having more than just two eyes in the movement pattern is really good because now you can talk as a team and support each other on what you feel like you have to work on building, building up and getting stronger and whatever is uh, limited, you have to increase the range of motion, you know, I, and I'm big on, you know, it's pretty, to me, it's simple. What's, what's weak you strengthen and, uh, and what's, what's, uh, and what's cannot move, you work on that range of motion and it could be more of a soft tissue restriction, or it could be a, a joint issue that you have to work on increasing that joint kinematic uh, movement pattern. Good. Um, 
I imagine jumping and jumping mechanics must play a big role in basketball and the way players land. Yeah. Deceleration. You know, you got to have your brakes have to be just as good as your as as your as your gas pedal. You know, I'm big on brakes, um, posterior chain, hamstrings, uh, glutes, soleus muscles, big in the lower leg. Um, you know, all your, your scap thoracic, you know, that's huge. Uh, lumbar spine, um, how you break, i.e. how you decelerate is important. It's really huge. Uh, so training eccentrically, but getting to the movement pattern that you can be able to even train with that kind of movement. Right. So you, your muscles have to be strong enough to be able to, to be able to turn off the muscle pattern in an elongated um, positioning eccentrically. So Training in the eccentric movements and training basketball movements, um, getting guys on, on on vector machines, on pulleys, uh, using um, controlled um, Kaiser machines, uh, you know, dumbbell. Just it's just a movement pattern of having someone that can assist you in your mechanics and your movement, making sure that you're not loading the joint as much as you are putting um, strength and um, and and more emphasis on muscle strength and muscle movement patterns, you know, so you won't, you know, be contraindicated on your, on what you're trying to train and what you're trying to get better at. Right. So training eccentrically, um, we all know uh, science has shown us like isometric training is huge. Uh, that's big. Uh, the soleus muscle is big for the ACL um, just as much as uh, reducing calf strain. Why, why, why is isometric training so important? Well, uh, first of all, it's 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 tension, it's load under tension, right? So without movement. So if you're training isometrically, you're not moving through the joint. You're you're just putting that muscle under tension, and when you put the muscle under tension, you get tensile forces that you normally get when you push off and when you have resistance, right? So that muscle fibers are 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 in the sarcomeres and and all the fiber intrinsics of a muscle really get recruited. They get recruited and get stronger, and this is all through um, um, testing and and um, and actually results that we see. You know, we like to do a lot of uh, isometric calf strengthening, um, quad iso training for tendon tendon loading is big. You know, for for our basketball athletes, and you do isometric tendon loading. You know, for our guys, but putting tendons under under stress um, with load without movement, where well, they're just recruiting a lot of that that load and tension. Right. So, you know, just I mean, how, we used to we used to be away from quad extensions. Right. That used to be old school. You know, now you're back doing, you know, isometric quad, you know, contraction, you know, contraction, you know, contract, hold, contract, hold, release type stuff. You know, oh, that's interesting because for a while it was all no, you got to use closed chain exercises. We don't yeah. use open chain. Right. Yeah. Now you have iso, you do isometric, you know, contract, you know, hold contract, isometric holding, you know, for quad tendon, I, um, patella tendon loading, uh, Achilles tendon, you know, eccentrically, you can load them, you know, in uh, split stance, um, uh, isometric holds as if they're in a running stance, you know, have your back leg, you know, with like maybe like Kaiser um, um, uh, shoulder press uh, squat machines uh, with the tension and load coming all through uh, through your body, you know, making sure that that tendon is getting that load that it's going to endure when it actually plays um, again against contact too. So, um, so it's it's good, man. It's a, it's fun. It's fun to um, see results. It's fun to have players who have had issues and who has issues and to kind of take them through the entire season on a high hygiene program, isometric hygiene program and a performance-based corrective exercise program. But you can't just do corrective exercises, right? Because you know, right. you know, you you if you're six, seven, 235 pounds, you can't just do bands, right? Because no, of course not. You gotta you gotta maintain your strength and your speed and your power. Yeah, you low you gotta load the tissue, right? Because you're right. gonna have resistive load against you. You're gonna have six nine you know, 270 pushing against you. So you right. have to be able to train that accordingly and throughout the season, you know, now you have to periodize it to where you're not doing it. You got to make sure you know when you're doing it because you have to factor in travel. Um, do we have uh, four games in seven days? Um, is it on the East Coast, West Coast? Uh, um, is it in a hot, dry climate um, in your hydration with your tissue? Uh, are we going to do it two times this week or are we going to do it three? You know, are we going to do less less sets less sets um but more times this week you know that kind of thing so 
that's where it gets tricky. That's where it gets fun. And I think that's where experience comes in. Also, um, one thing you can't teach or take away, which is huge for um, the respectability and the trust from the athlete to know what kind of program they may need or may want. You know, now who's professional, who's not is the results you get from the player who wants to put the time in for the program that you that you arrange for them. You know? I've heard of some players that do their weight training after the game. Other players do it in the morning. What do you prefer, or does it depend on the athlete? It depends on the athlete, but uh, you know, you know, your metabolic rate is higher after 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 play, so you know your endorphins are going. So you know, you want to still get that pump, you know, as if you're still playing um, with the resistance. Um, then you got, you know, you have your other notion of, you know, you want to recover right after the game, so you get a better output after you recover and rest you know, the next day. Um, and it's kind of like a, a mix, a mixed thing with guys. Uh, some say, hey, let's go knock this out now, you know, and I think, uh, you know, this, uh, I'm kind of torn in between. Um, I, I haven't seen any uh, wrong between the two. I think uh, our, our injury risk has, has not been this um, any different for one guy lifting more after game opposed to the next day. Now, if you do have four games and, in seven in seven days, you know we do know how many games you play a week. You go, and guys want to lift after the game, you know, not back to backs, of course, but they're going to get the the amount of lift they need for the season. You know, now will you be able to lift more weight the next day? Probably so. So that's where you have to talk with the athlete about um, what your uh, your programming, what you need to get done, or what they haven't done that you need to maybe have a little bit more recovery to do. You know, but our strength coach, he does an unbelievable job. He's he's really good at getting guys in the weight room, whether it's the next day or, or after games. Um, and you see that across the league. You see a lot of guys getting it, getting in. So, hey, let's be honest. Some guys, they don't want to come in the next day. So, but at least they get it in. You know? right. um, so now that it's the off season, what kinds of things are your players focusing on in terms of well, strength and, you, and rehab and stuff? You, you, you do do uh, off season evaluation and assessment, like we talked about earlier. Uh, comparable to what it was like in the beginning of the season and midseason, and that determines your programming. So um, you do go over an evaluation over each player, and and you talk about what were your strengths this season, literally and figuratively. What were your strengths? Um, what did you see that you liked in the weight room? What did you see you liked in the training room? What can you get better at? What do you need to get better at? What do the coaches see? Um, what does our strength coaches see you need to improve? Um, and we kind of put together what the coaches see they need you to get better at, rather it's lateral movement, power, more uh, stronger. Uh, you need to get more, you get more, you need to get stronger upper body to get more depth and distance on your jump shot. We need you to be able to move laterally quicker defensively. So you kind of put those things together to, to build, like I said earlier, a comprehensive program for what the off-season training will be to customize for what you need. So, you, you know, you sit down with guys within the first two weeks of the off-season to kind of go over that plan, what coaches and medical staff may see. And then, of course, the player, what do you see? What, you know, what do you need to get better at um, transparently? And then what do you, what do the team think you need to be better at? So you put all that together. And then you have the program of how you go about doing it, where the player is going to be working out in season. I'm sorry, off season at home or off season in at in the practice facility. And you kind of we kind of do a Monday through Thursday deal, you know, with our guys. We kind of give that Friday off and you know, give and take. Um, but we we don't jeopardize that Monday. That's why we give the Friday off, right? So Monday through Thursday. Uh, and then we kind of um, retest and if a guy, if a guy needs to gain weight, we kind of see where he is, you know, after, after, you know, some time, maybe three, four weeks or whatever it may be. Uh, if a guy needs to lose weight, uh, if a guy, uh, we'll, we'll retest, um, probably before they get into live contact type of play in their off season programming. But now we have guys who are younger, uh, contract players who will play in the summer league. So we do some, um, we kind of, you know, uh, uh, increase the, the workload preparing them for the summer league and make sure their strength work is the uh, is up along with their condition. But that, no, don't get me wrong. These guys, they do take their time off. They do rest immediately after the season. And, and then they ramp back up. Uh, but uh, like I said, our strength coach does a good job working on getting them prepared for their summer league routine and or their entire off-season regimen. 
And let's be honest, a lot of a uh, few guys have their own guys that they work with outside of team. So keeping that relationship and rapport is really good. So both parties and both sides can be working hand in hand with each other. What kinds of things do you track to see if players are overtraining, doing too much as versus not doing enough? Yeah, in-house, in-house, um, our sports science crew, they do a good job. Uh, we use the Connexon system. Um, okay. Those, those are small little chips that they embed in their shorts, in the back of their shorts on the waistline. And that give us some good output, um, you know, and I like to use I like to use the red, yellow, green system. You know, is a player exerting himself in the red where he's working really, really hard right now? Are they are they in a yellow you know, where they're kind of in a moderate state of exertion? Right. Or if they're I won't say the green, if they're not, you know, dogging it or pushing it or not really dogging or pushing it. But if the activity level that they're working at um, isn't that strenuous. Right. So if a player has multiple days of being in the red, then we know now we have to up their recovery. Right. Or we have to. And ha- what determines that they're in the red? How, how do you determine that? No, there's a there's a there's a there's a sensor, the Connexon sensor. We'll oh, put, OK. Yeah, yeah. The sensor that they wear. Oh, and is this looking at uh, heart rate recovery? Yeah. Heart rate recovery okay. um, and, and, and energy output. You OK. Know, their, their output. So. We would, uh, if a guy, so if a guy's numbers, if they're 500 or above multiple days, you know, uh, then we're like, hey, look, we got to think about what the recovery is. But it's also uh, a subjective feedback as well from the player. Like, how you feel this week? You know, I see, you know, you've been over the 500, over 500 in the, in the red for like the last three days this week. I feel good. I feel good. So that may be their norm, you know, or they, I feel a little tired. So then, you know, we may, work hand in hand with the strength coach. I'm sorry, with the with the player development coach and let them know, hey, we need to have maybe like a lighter day today. Maybe go like a 20 minute just, you know, shooting uh, workout. Or if it's a guy feels like he can do more or he doesn't feel too bad, say, hey, look, and the player development coach is like, hey, look, I want to implement some some rim touch um finishes in some defensive segments. And his Connexon numbers show that he hasn't been exerted. He doesn't, you know, report any um, ailments or soreness, and he feels like he can do it. Then we may add that to his regimen, you know. So it's a it's a new school of of adding a tool to help um, make sure a player is stays uh, adequately prepared to output when it's time when you don't have the Connexon, you don't have the measuring um, components available. Right. So what sorts of things can you do to promote recovery? I know there's the norm attack compression sleeves. Um, mm-hmm. There's a number of other things that are available. Hyperbaric oxygen. People do cold plunges. They have the yeah. cryotherapy. What sorts of th- things do you feel like moves the needle as, as far as I recovery? Mean, you, you, just, you just said quite a few of them, right? So... I mean, like you said, Norma Tech, you know, uh, we, I mean, we do, of course, massage flushing. Uh, um, there's, you know, you have different, you know, uh, tart cherry juice. That's a good recovery too. You know, um, okay. magnesium is good for sleep. You know, it's really good. Um, contrast, I'm not big, too, you know, cold tub. Yeah, you can do that. But contrasting is really good um, for recovery, even before activity. I, I tell our guys, you do a hot, cold, hot, cold. And before activity, you want to finish in the warm when you do a contrast, right? So, and after activity, you go hot, cold, hot, cold, and finish in the cold, right? So you have them go like in a sauna and then into. Well, they can do sauna. We have, a, you know, we have a hot jacuzzi and a cold, a cold plunge. And I usually go three minutes, three minutes, and they may go three cycles and finish in the warm before they hop on the table or hop in the weight room, right? right. That's before practice. And then after practice, they may do the same and then finish in the cold. Right. Right. Um, So or they may just go 10 to 12 minutes of cold afterwards. Um, But I like to kind of keep the the muscle tissue elastic and kind of keep blood circulating as as while it's recovering um, with cold as well. That's why I like the two dynamics. Um, Recovery types are big. Um, I like uh, this. uh, It's a it's a portable unit called firefly 
that fits uh, right around the fibula head and it's electrical stimulation that pumps you know, and keeps blood circulation all the way through your lower leg and to your entire body. Firefly is the name of the, uh, the, the product. I really like that. It's portable, uh, no wireless. Uh, you wear it on flights. You wear it after games. Um, it also helps for, for a lot of lower leg injuries. And how, how does it, it works through electrical stimulation? Yeah, or? electrical stimulation, and and it's uh, it's powered by just a simple button push on the actual um, um, device. So it's a it's a long strip that you put right on your um right behind your fibular head. Yeah, you may get like a little perineal nerve um, um, impulse uh, contraction, a non fatiguing contraction, and um, you really get that electrical stim, almost like a high volt pulse. Uh, for recovery, keeping that blood circulated. Now, I've seen some good results, even with injury, and not just recovery. Recovery, you keep it on for four hours, and for um, for injury, you can you keep it on um, as well, and it kind of helps plump out the fluid for uh, for swelling. Um, as for the lactic acid as well, too. So, Firefly is big. We said Norma Tech uh, recovery tights, uh, hot and cold plunge, um, cryo chambers. We mentioned that you know, as, um, also. I know uh, some players use hyperbaric oxygen. Yeah, that's um I like to use that for injury. Um the the big the big tanks are really good for for injury. Um but the oxygen I think helps you for sleep, you know. I think it helps you um kind of wind down and um, get those red blood cells kind of uh, relaxed and so you can sleep better. Um it's not going to make you sleep, but it's going to help you get into more of a relaxation um frame of mind to be able to sleep. Uh and sleep and, and sleep is a huge that's that can that can be a whole nother podcast of sleep is is another thing that's huge that goes under underrated uh, for your your mental recovery and for your body recovery because that's when the body is actually doing all of its work for what you did you know so for a hard training athlete how much sleep do you recommend and also do you track quality of sleep like uh deep sleep um yeah we sleep uh, yeah, uh, I mean, you know, it's st still the same. I think eight hours is, is still okay. the same you want to have, uh, no less than six. Um, some guys, if you get 10, that's great. But uh, how are you tracking that? Uh, we we have a uh, thing called the Aura Ring. Yeah. -U -R -A, yep. the Aura Ring we've, we've used and used for our players. And um, that kind of can digitize and electronically let you know um, your deep sleep, your REM sleep, yep. uh, restless sleep, you know. Uh, and you know, it's it seemed to have worked worked out pretty good because uh, how a player responds and says, you know, without even looking at the numbers, uh, man, I slept pretty good, and they may be at eighty nine or ninety, you know, the percentile of, of sleep. Or if a guy says he, he you know he slept pretty crappy, uh, and he could be at fifty four or forty five or you know, and but what is the reason why you slept crappy, and you know, and what's the purpose, and is it is it nutritionally, you know, your body's trying to digest uh, processed foods more than just natural foods? Um, is it that you uh, aren't recovering well because you're exerting yourself too much and you're not hydrated enough for your organs to relax and calm down and actually do its job? Um, so you know, sleep is huge um, um, for your recovery and for your body to uh, actually um, put to work all the things that you've done throughout the day, right? So you just mentioned hydration. What are some of the general rules you like to use in terms of hydration for the players, um, how much should they drink? When should they use a sports drink? What kind of sports drinks do you like? Um, yeah, everyone says hydrate, hydrate. What is hydration? Hydration is more than just water, right? Um, we know our body is 80%, uh, our muscle tissue is 80% water, but we also have to realize uh, we need our magnesium and potassium uh, and minerals in our body, right? So magnesium is huge, is a huge part. That's hydration to me. Uh, electrolytes, magnesium is hydration. Um, I like, uh, there's tons of products out there. Um, I like, we use Drip Drop, we use uh, Liquid IV. Those are two products that we really, our guys really like. Um, um, those, yeah, th those are the two, two biggest ones that we use. Uh, uh, and, you know, just simple salt alone is, 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 is good for good electrolyte for the, for the muscle tissue and the bloodstream. So drip drop is one, like I said, um, liquid IV is another one, but I, I think hydration encompasses the electrolytes of the magnesium and the, and the salt, uh, that the body needs and not just water. Right. 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 And, right. and, 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 and minimize the sugar. Right. Right. Uh, not to knock different. Uh, I'm not into the business of knocking different, you know, products and all that. But 
really look at sugar count. They may have the electrolytes in them, but they also may have the sugar for the taste. So you have to think about, you know, it's not going to taste great if you're going to get all the nutrients that you need for your for your electrolytes and replenish your fluids, right? So less right. Le- less is best when it comes to sugar, and the magnesium is huge, and and you know some of them have the zinc in it as well. You know, zinc is big. So uh, drip drop is a good one. Like I said, liquid IV is another good one. Um, we use another company called uh, Revitalite. Revitalite is another one, um, which is pretty good. Um, like they're made in like you know sixteen ounce, uh, re- thirty two ounce, ready to go um, bottles for our guys. Um, so, yeah. Um, what about at halftime? What kinds of things do you like to use to refuel them? And actually, let's go into the whole nutrition thing for a little bit. And I realize we could spend hours on each one of these topics, but. Um, in general, in terms of the nutritional, uh, you know, what what's best for athletes um, to get maximum performance? Is there a type of nutritional program that you prefer in general? Does each player have their own uh, nutritional perspective? Um, how important are some of the different factors like protein intake and carbohydrates for fueling, et cetera? Well, you know, I don't claim to be a dietitian, nor do I um, act as if I'm one. Um, right. we, have, we have that specialty and we have that skill set that helps us with our guys. Um, but just the concepts and the basic uh, normality that you deal with is, uh, you know, I mean, of course, fuel, right? Carbohydrates and protein. Like we, uh, protein is big for uh, building bodily tissue. We know carbohydrates is big for energy. And of course, you have, you know, your less percent intake of, of good fats, right? Right. So, um, we do, uh, we have, I mean, our chefs do a good job of um, of specializing the meal plans based on what's needed for morning um, and and after practice, after game, um, um, food, um, energy intake, right? So we try to really, you know, uh, carbo load before activity, um, as quiet as kept and as easy as it may sound, uh, small snacks before games or peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, right? You know, we okay. do that. You know, uh, after games, we try to do some big protein, you know, to rebuild bodily tissues. And, you know, we have what, um, what about at halftime? Oh, halftime is a, uh, we have um, uh, guys do a lot of uh, energy bars. That, um, uh, energy bars are big. Uh, some guys may take some you know scoops of peanut butter or something like that. Um, fruit is a big thing. Huge thing. I uh, have certain guys who traditionally do. I remember Serge Ibaka was a big banana, apple, orange guy at halftime, you know. Um, Zubak has his things. Um, Paul has his thing. We got some guys who you know have their little routine, but the hydration is is huge, and they all have their their small little uh, uh, superstitions of hy- hydration or replenish things that they like, like to do. Uh, of course, uh, energy uh, um, packets um, where they where they do the uh, energy uh, energy quick packs are big uh, for replenishing and have time. And of course, how much you play determines how much right. you need to quit. Also. Yeah. You know, Do but, some uh, of the guys get IVs at halftime? No, no, no. We don't administer um, IVs. It's not even it's not even legal to do in the NBA. Oh, OK. You have to administer that uh, in, a, in a sanitary, you know, um, uh, hospital. Right. So. OK. Um, what part how important is taping in preventing injuries and helping to manage injuries? And I know there's different types of taping. There's K tape, there's you know, standard athletic tape. Yeah, um, taping, you know, that's that's a you know, a long time traditional thing for guys in all 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 of sport. Um I I I like I've been a wizardry, you know, I've been a wizard and and have had you know, great uh, approaches with using tape for different injuries. Um, that's where you get kind of, you know, unique and you get creative with that, with with hands, finger sprains, uh, shoulder injuries, uh, you know, ankles, even knees. Like you, you do different things based off knowing the anatomy, right? And understanding how it's a spiral and how you trying to move a, a, a simple soft tissue um, away from the injured part or try to move some tissue off of a ligament, um, 
try to support a tendon that's in its groove. So just knowing your anatomy of what you're trying to support and what you're trying to prophylactically help a player use, like like you said, Kinesio tape is another one. is a is a brand product that is used. Um, you know, vastly. Some believe in it, some don't. Uh, it's all about what the player likes um, or what you're trying to promote to help them to see if they say, okay, let's go with it. Um, you see it a lot, you know, shoulder stuff. You see a lot of kinesio with knee stuff or patellofemoral issues. Um, I like using uh, uh, Meccano taping also. Um, you really get some uh, force and tension on that Meccano tape, that brown, the brown tape with the, uh, with the uh, cover roll to really get move bony structures, uh, to move soft tissue. Um, so just knowing your anatomy is huge for using taping techniques. And I have a lot of I have a lot of techniques that aren't even in the books that I've used that have worked for, for guys, you know, right. uh, and, it, and it just sometimes some things just work and some things don't work. You know, guys, I, I don't you know. So, you know, you kind of play with it a little bit. But the, the main thing is the main thing with with taping is what are you trying to support? What are you trying to help? So that's what you work on as a common denominator for the different taping techniques and a different style of tape that you use also. Right. Um, it, this is a more of a general question, but if, mm -hmm. if from my perspective as an NBA fan, it seems like the league's overall attitude towards injuries has changed over time. Uh, for a, a number of years ago, it seemed like players were sort of expected to play even if they were in pain, as long as there wasn't a major injury. And and then that sort of changed over time. And then we had a few years where it seemed like it was getting to be more common for players to take days off. And we heard about load management. I even heard about agents being involved in helping to direct medical care. And then a few years ago, it seemed like the fans were complaining that all these star players weren't playing and the NBA ownership wasn't happy. And it looks like the NBA has put a few rules in place to reduce load management, to encourage players to play more. Um, and uh, how how has this impacted your job? Um, it's 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 moved the needle to. Uh, make players more accountable for um, choosing when and why they want to sit out or want to rest. Right. Uh, it, it's just, it, I think it was more putting the uh, the players on, on notice more so than trying to crack the whip. I think, uh, I think it's important for the league to recognize, you know, players are playing 82 games. They're not going to never change that, you know, they have it, you know, and you lose too much. You do. Too much money involved in all those eight games with all the TV contracts and everything. Right, right. So, so how do we how do we navigate through the space of making sure that players can still play, but also think about why they don't want to play or aren't going to play, and um, and I think that's one of the main reasons why the league, you know, in integrated this, and uh, I think it served. It's you know the numbers have probably served true uh, for what they're doing. And, you know, you know, I, you know, it can get sticky when you talk about certain things and certain reasons. Um, you can't never question a player why he doesn't want to play. Sure. But you also can put him on notice on the rules that um, the league will get, you know, come back to the team. If we have uh, a certain reason why you aren't playing that, that's, that's not abiding by the rule. Right? right. So how you how you place the information to the player. Um, understanding what a player really cannot play with and what he can play with. Right. Um, being being respectful of them and their job and that it is their body. Uh, but I think the players and the players union um, and the league um, puts the, the players on notice enough to realize that they have to be more conscious about um, the decisions on when they want to play or when they can or cannot play and what they can play with. Right. Right. You know, so, you know, having two star players sit out together, you know, is a, is an issue um, for rest. Right. But if they have injuries, you got to show proof that they have injuries. Right. And, you know, so the league, uh, they definitely hold teams accountable for making sure that these players have legitimate injuries that they're sitting out for. 
and you can't rest two players, you know, that have been, you know, uh, on an all NBA team, you know, within the last couple of years. So, you know, there's, there's parameters to it. Uh, and it's I, kind of a fine line. I mean, it is a fine you line. have pain. Is that an injury? Maybe, maybe it is. It, mm-hmm. you know, we generally think of pain as a, as resulting from injury, but sometimes it's a fine line. Right. Right. No, pain is a fine line. And, who's a better judge of that than the person who's dealing with it. Right. And that's sure. where knowing your athlete and respecting your athlete, but also having the athlete understand and respect the job you have to do and respect, um, you know, that you're going to have the player's best interests. Right. right. I'm, I'm in the business of making sure players know I have their best interests more so than uh, forcing myself to do a job to make myself look good. You right. know, like, I think that's that's huge. And trust, which is one of my four principles, is 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 big. And um you can't you can't get that overnight. It's just over time through exam from example and experience um to to gain that. When it comes to the treatment of non-surgical injuries, there's been a plethora of new uh physical therapy modalities in the last number of years. We there's various types of lasers. There's class three lasers, class four lasers. We we we've had electrical stimulation and ultrasound for years. We have shock wave. There's a a bunch of there seems like there's always a new machine. Well, are there any of these modalities that you find really move the needle in helping with recovery? Uh, I'm not like I mentioned before. I'm, I'm not married to I'm not married to need either one. Uh, as one is like ultimately the best thing out there, right? Right. Um, we use all of what you just mentioned, uh, shockwave, laser. Um, um, but don't, you know, we're not a big electrical STEM team. Like uh, our, our sports medicine staff, we're not big on electrical STEM. Um, when we do, we like using the Mark Pro. The Mark Pro is a big one. Um, like I said, we use the Firefly for recovery uh, and lower leg uh, injuries. Um, but you know, as as far as uh, modalities, uh, I do like Shockwave. Uh, the Zimmer Shockwave is pretty good. Uh, um, the E-Pulse is a pretty good one, too. Um, there's different levels of it. Uh, but whatever, the, it depends on the indication, too, right? Uh, right. And consistency of how you're using it, uh, that's, that's, that's huge. Uh, so um, I think these are the best things in the business. <laughs> uh, they can't, they can't steer you wrong but it's also a, a feel and, and a player's response to uh to treatment um uh, and i think modalities are are secondary and a support right. to manual therapy and for those who are listening rather than watching you held up your hands so you're talking about using your hands to do your hands, soft therapy. tissue work uh, soft manipulation tissue work. yeah you know. so joint joint mobilization uh, um, acupressure, uh, um, uh, active uh, ART, active release techniques that you do with your right. hand, um, utilizing tools with that for deeper pressure or less or less pressure, um, and 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 modalities complement that. Modalities complement manual therapy, so they all work together. And as I said, that's the uniqueness of our job. There's no there's no one modality that's better than the other. Um, you try everything. I've tried a lot of things over the, over the years and you couple that with, uh, the robust, uh, staff that we have and, you know, the things that everyone does, um, uh, from of course, like what you do, the chiropractic work, uh, manipulation, uh, you know, you, you, you have, uh, we have our doctors who do, uh, uh, biologic, you know, injections, you know, things of that nature, you know, outside, you know, that's, that's part of, uh, are you guys using work. peptides a lot these days? Um, if, if it's needed, you know, if peptide injection is needed, but, you know, different cocktails are, are, are designed and, and by, you know, our team doctor, Dr. Steve Yoon, who's, who's pretty good. He's out there, you know, pretty good, one of the best in the business. You know, people go to use him from across the world, but, you know, biologic injections are big based off your, your pathology and your indications of what you may have going on. Um, so with you, biologic, you're generally referring to PRP. That's and, a basic, yeah. PRP is a basic one. Uh, right. You know, you have your um, hyaline, um, hyaline injection, HA injections. Uh, you know, you got, it's, it's so many different kinds. Uh, 
We got stem cells or exosomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have you have different ones. It all depends on what you what you need, you know. Um, and the 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 clinician who's doing the injections will kind of you know educate on uh, what are are good ones, you know. They have umbilical cord ones that they that they use too. So right. It's it's a it's a lot of different ones um, based on your situation. PRP is the, the more most traditional one. Now, how you spend that, and um, how much of the white blood cells you use, or or what you inject it with, with the PRP is in, is is big too. You know, so ten x ten x is another procedure. You know that you do also for you know, tendon stuff. So it's a lot. You can go on and on. Uh, I don't want to sit here and be a a, a chemist. And, and mention all this kind of stuff and about what I know and what I don't know, but it's more so applicable based off your indication. And then once these things are brought up by the expert, then you kind of go over the the, the return time, the um, the um, efficacy you know, rate of it, um, and the uh, the benefit and the pros and cons, and 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 you know, and how does it impact your downtime, you know, for your for your sport. It's been great. A um, couple of easy questions to end. Um, what do you like best about your job? It, like I mentioned before, it beats working. Um, <laughs> I, I, I enjoy I enjoy what I do. I enjoy interacting with the athletes. Uh, it's been my it's kind of been a been a gift of mine. Having been an athlete, and, and even at my age now, understanding you know, the new athletes. You know, my son plays um, basketball at a high level. My daughter is uh, in the sports as well. So cool. I enjoy, I enjoy uh, being around the athletes and, 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 and having a staff that I can work with that understands athletes and want the best for the athlete. Right. So I enjoy my workspace, my work environment, my, my colleagues, uh, and I enjoy working the sport and being around the guys. Uh, it's all every day is, every day is a different day. Um, right. But I, I I find the communication is huge um, with the athletes and staff. I find trying to find trust amongst everyone is huge, um, and you also try to have uh, a balance amongst it all, um, and you also try to make sure you're humble amongst it all. You know, I just let I just said my four principles in life in that. You know, okay, what are they? Yeah, uh, balance, trust, communication, and humbleness. Those are my four principles. So, and, and being humble, like having done this for so long, uh, just as an athletic trainer, um, I know it could come and go at any time. It could have come and gone. And I love what I do. Like I said, it beats working. So I love to continue to do it. So, you know, I don't, I don't take it for granted. Um, and I think I've been put in this space to help not just athletes, but to help people, you know, being a caregiver is important to me. Um, I've helped a lot of lives along the way. Um, I've given a lot of advice along the way. Um, I've uh, made a lot of friendships along the way. And I think that's part of who I am and what I'm about and trying to serve. I'm a server, you know, and that's what God put us on this earth to do. And I, and I just hope that I can continue to do it. And as long as whoever wants me to do it, you know, uh, that's what's what I'm here for. So the best part is, is, is working with, 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 with the athletes and just helping people, whether it's a, uh, Rather it's the general manager, rather it's the 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 uh, the, the the equipment manager, uh, the scout, whoever comes in, you just want to be able to help them. That's great. That's a great way to end. So yeah. thank you so much, Jason. This was a great interview. No problem, Ben. Thanks for having me. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast. I would appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give us a five-star ratings and review. If you would like to work with me personally to help you improve your health, I do accept a limited number of new patients per month for a functional medicine consultation. Some of the areas I specialize in include helping patients with specific health issues like gut problems, neurodegenerative conditions, autoimmune diseases, cardiometabolic conditions, or for an executive health screen and to help you promote longevity and take a deeper dive into some of those factors that can lead to chronic diseases along the way, please call my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Office at 
3111 and we'll set you up for a new consultation for functional medicine. And I look forward to speaking to everybody next week.